So in this here FMG question on the recall based analysis what we have seen that there is a lot of vertical integration between the subject. So they have actually picked up a particular topic and they have integrated subjects from preclinical spectrum to the clinical spectrum. So mostly physiology falls under the medicine, physiology, pharmacology, pathology gradient and if you have a strong base of this subject you can not only will be able to uh, solve the questions from physiology you can also will be able to solve all these integrated circuits question actually. So uh, once again if we analyze the question one recall based question that has come to us which is also uh, present uh, many times in previous years that is hypoxic hypoxia is seen in carbon monoxide poisoning you can see over there HC and cyanide poisoning uh, ischemia and AV shunt. Now they are actually testing it's a basic question and they are actually testing your knowledge regarding hypoxia. So first we have to brush up knowledge a little bit. What is hypoxia? It is lack of partial pressure of oxygen at tissue and one close term that is present over there is hypoxemia. So what is that? Hypoxemia is lack of partial pressure of oxygen at blood mostly in the arterial side we basically tell. So arterial side. Now the question says hypoxic hypoxia and we need to look upon the other uh, you know the, the other classifications of hypoxia. So what are the other types of hypoxia? So we have hypoxic hypoxia, we have ischemic hypoxia, we have anemic hypoxia and we have histotoxic hypoxia. So let us quickly brush up our knowledge regarding each types. We are starting with ischemic hypoxia where you see the blood flow to an organ is deficient. This is low so that's why oxygen concentration is low. Anemic hypoxia, hemoglobin is low. So hemoglobin you know it carries oxygen so if hemoglobin is low the or hypoxia is happening due to that. Histotoxic. Now there is certain toxicity at cellular level and that's why oxygen utilization at cellular level the internal respiration that is deficient. So mostly there are certain toxins to the cytochrome system. So that, that's why the O2 utilization at cellular level is low. Now this examples if we give and um, you can understand it better and lastly hypoxic hypoxia is the oxygen concentration is actually low in arterial side so that is hypoxic hypoxia now let us give you certain example which will make you make it clear to you histotoxic so certain toxins which decreases or which inhibits the cytochrome system and very known patent toxin popular toxin is cyanide so cyanide causes histotoxic hypoxia not hypoxic hypoxia anemic hypoxia so anemic hypoxia will happen when there is less hemoglobin not only in number of percentage of mass but also less hemoglobin function now one example of less hemoglobin function is carbon monoxide poisoning what happens in carbon monoxide poisoning you know that carbon monoxide is 200 times more strong um, in case of affinity to hemoglobin than and the affinity of oxygen so therefore carbon monoxide whenever it is too much in body it will simply engulf hemoglobin it will simply kick oxygen out of hemoglobin and it will engulf or encroach hemoglobin now what we have we have hemoglobin with carbon monoxide carboxy hemoglobin and they are unable to carry oxygen so therefore the result is hypoxia oxygen is present not only that hemoglobin is also present so level of hemoglobin is same no issue with that but still hypoxia is happening ischemic hypoxia is a different type of hypoxia there is some kind of stagnation or ischemia or less blood flow to a particular organ that's why that organ or that blood uh, blood nearby that organ is not getting or tissue nearby that organ is not getting enough oxygen and hypoxia is happening and hypoxic hypoxia it is the truest hypoxia where the hypoxia is happening due to lack of oxygen so out of all the options now if we come carbon monoxide cause causes already from here it is clear that anemic hypoxia hcn cyanide poisoning causes histotoxic hypoxia so this goes for the histotoxic 
this goes for the anemic now ischemia is a separate zone so the only answer that is left now the efficient and that's why efficient is the answer now let me explain efficient a little bit in case of efficient there is a shunt there is an uh, there is a pathway admixing of blood between venous side and arterial side due to presence of a shunt so what happens in arterial side blood gets admixed from venous side so blood becomes more deoxidized blood becomes more blood contains more carbon dioxide so therefore oxygen concentration of blood in arterial side is less due to this admixation and hypoxia hypoxia happens now we are going to the next question and our next question is pr interval in ecg denotes so once again there are certain options are there but even before looking at those options we must understand that ecg is a very important topic you cannot decipher whether it is coming from pharma or medicine or physiology so from all the subjects the more we repeat ecgs the more we reverse ecgs it will give us or it will help us fetching more marks now peer interval in ecg denotes it denotes that means the, they are testing your knowledge regarding various ecg interval ecg webs so let us let us explain them and then we shall go to the options so first let me draw a normal lead to ecg which is extremely important to know so this is p wave you see the first uh, one more thing that I need to ponder over here also we have ECG videos there you can also see it in more detail but one thing you can uh, you can ponder over here see there are different kinds of waves on an ECG if we take it as a baseline there are certain waves who are going upward and there are certain waves who are going downward so the upward waves we normally say these are the positive waves it's just the dictum and then downward waves we call it negative word once again from some points of view of physiology the plus wave positive wave that denotes depolarization whereas the negative waves that denotes repolarization anyway so let us enumerate all the waves over here this is the p wave which is the first upward deflection which is small enough then we have a q and then we have r and then we have this s and then we have an isoelectric segment st segment and then we have t now what is pr interval it is the beginning of p to beginning of qrs so this is the pr interval so pr interval now what does every wave here you know um, interprets p is for atrial depolarization is extremely important you need to remember understand and memorize then you have q this is for septal depolarization septal depolarization we have qrs complex this is for ventricular depolarization we have st segment which is from here to here st segment pr interval so st segment it is an isoelectric period and this isoelectric period signifies end of depolarization to beginning of repolarization and last but not the least we have T wave which is again a positive wave it is a repolarization this is the repolarization of ventricle now remember in our ECG videos we have explained T is a positive wave but it is a repolarizing wave the problem is why even after being a negative wave it becomes um, even after becoming a positive wave why it becomes um, repolarization we have detailed explanation in our ECG physiology uh, sh shortly what I can say that the direction of vector here is actually away from a positive lead that's why it happens now coming back to the question so their interval between P and QRS that is the peer interval that during that interval what 
actually happens. If you look at our chart over here, P denotes atrial depolarization. So, the sinoatrial node, it has already depolarized. So, it has already, you know, fired. Now, once sinoatrial node has fired, it will come to the AV node, atrioventricular node through the internodal tracts. And after that, AV node, there is some AV nodal delay. The reason being lack of gap junction in AV node. And that also signifies the rule of heart which states when atria is in systole, ventricle is in diastole but however we again come back to our discussion and conduction system now after every nodal delay there is during every nodal delay and a slightly later than every nodal delay there is an isoelectric period that means no conduction is actually happening from atria to ventricle so therefore we get a particular zone which is isoelectric there is no positive or negative deflection but after that it is taken over by the bundle of A's and bundle of A's is again divided into two bundle branches and both of them are parallel to the septum. Remember, septum is depolarized in this fashion, in the violet arrow fashion. That means in a semicircular fashion from right side to left side. So therefore, Q wave vector comes as a small negative wave. So, our question is PR interval. That means big end of depolarization at SA node up to beginning of beginning of depolarization of septum. And from this picture, you can see in this period, one thing only is happening that is conduction of depolarization through AV node. So, PR interval gives us the conduction of, you know, conduction of depolarization to AV node. But before we go into this, we also have to, you know, nullify the other three options. Ventricular depolarization, it's very sure shot. We know this is QRS. So, this is QRS. Ventricular repolarization, again, sure shot, we know that is T. And atrial repolarization that is unseen because it actually happens during QRS. So, atrial repolarization happens over here. But since QRS is a big positive wave, it masks any deflection from atrial repolarization. So, once again, we are coming PR interval in ECG denotes conduction through AV nodes. And at this point, heart is electrically inert that's why it's uh, isoelectric phase now we are coming to this is a very common question hyperkalemia means serum potassium more than 4.5 milli equivalent more than 5.5 milli equivalent more than 7.5 milli equivalent more than 10.5 milli equivalent it's a very straightforward question and you must know you can't afford to miss hyperkalemia in your clinics also so remember what is the normal potassium values remember sodium value potassium value this you must understand so sodium value like it is 135 to 145 milli equivalent you must remember sodium serum sodium value similarly you must remember serum potassium value that is 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalent per liter so from here it is extremely evident that more than 5.5 milli equivalent per liter is the hyperkalemia however more than 7.5 it becomes severe hyperkalemia and you have to take some serious measures over here and more than 10.5 it is actually life threatening and sometimes it may be you know incompatible to life a little bit about the management of hyperkalemia we must discuss over here however it falls under medicine one thing is that hyperkalemia, whenever hyperkalemia is there, you need to remember certain things. Hyperkalemia makes the body prone to develop acidosis. This is point number one. Then hyperkalemia is extremely evident and you must be very cautious in CKD patient who are very prone to develop hyperkalemia. There are certain ECG changes that happen in hyperkalemia, the most common being the tall peaked T wave. However, various arrhythmia can occur that there can be, you know, uh, the change in a PR interval may be shortened, may be broadened. 
there may be uh, you know complete heart block there may be atrial fibrillation to various arrhythmia ventricular fibrillation uh, ventricular flutter atrial flutter anything can happen in case of hyperkalemia now the management of hyperkalemia you must take certain stabilization method and also certain hypokalemic measure so certain stabilizer what is the actual danger that hyperkalemia or imminent danger that hyperkalemia causes it makes membrane unstable this is important so hyperkalemia makes all the membranes unstable and the most dreaded membrane is the cardiac membrane so you first have to stabilize cardiac membrane so the immediate thing in case of severe hyper hyperkalemia that we need to do we have to do a cardiac membrane stabilization so how we can do a cardiac membrane stabilization we normally use calcium gluconate solution and again the dose becomes 10 percent of calcium gluconate solution and 10 ml volume of calcium gluconate solution and we have to run it iv over 10 minutes so this this is a sure shot method but it doesn't decrease hyperkalemia and it is short lasting mostly it lasts for 45 minutes to one hour after then again membrane can become destabilized so that's why we have to use certain hypokalemic measure and hypokalemic measure is using of insulin using of glucose both of them what they cause they causes intracellular intracellular shift of calcium uh, potassium so therefore serum potassium it will lead to decrease in serum potassium level there are certain other methods one is the various k bind sachet that we use there are different polystyrene sulfates who actually binds potassium inside the gi tract decreases its absorption and that in that way it decreases so there is k bind sachet that you can use potassium binders these are actually potassium binders and we can also use beta 2 agonist like cell butamol as nebulization that will also cause intercellular shift of potassium which will lead to decrease the problem of hyperkalemia so now we are moving to the next one the which of the following is present in skeletal muscle this is about the glucose transporters again this is extremely favorite for quite a few years in fact last one decade many times constraints on gluco uh, glute and SGLT2 have come on also in pharmacology SGLT2 inhibitors these are new new drugs which are used in diabetic uh, uh, treatment so you must also know them so GLUT4, GLUT5, GLUT7 and GLUT2 these four are options before moving into them I will provide you a particular table which will clear out many doubts which will also give you a complete overview of the glucose and all the relevant and required substances for your FMG exam so we need to understand various glucose transporters and i am giving you a table which is here you can see the first is glut one and now it becomes very tedious if you want to remember everything regarding this so the thing is glut one most importantly two points you need to remember which is you can you can also copy from this but i would recommend you to remember all the glute they transports so remember only thing that they transport something and most of them transport glucose so their name is glucose trans glute glucose transporter they transport glucose but there are certain exceptions and few small small differences like some of the glutes are high affinity some of the glutes are low affinity and some of the glutes actually do not transport glucose rather they transport fructose now we are coming to it glute one remember they are present in RBC and placenta, also brain, kidney and retina and their function is glucose uptake. Now, mostly questions do not appear from here. GLUT2, this is important. They are present in beta cells of pancreas, intestine, liver. And remember, GLUT2, this is an MCQ part, GLUT2 is the glucose sensor for beta cell. And they are insulin independent glucose uptaker. Also, they are low affinity and they cause glucose uptake in liver. Now, GLUT3 that is present in neurons and brain and they are high affinity. Uptake of glucose happens. Now, we are coming to GLUT4. They are present in muscles and adipose tissue. 
So GLUT4 is present in skeletal muscle, heart muscle, adipose tissue and they are insulin dependent glucose uptake. So glucose uptake through GLUT4 depends on the level of insulin in body because insulin causes expression of GLUT4 and then only it can work as a glucose transporter and they are present in heart muscle, skeletal muscle, adipose tissue. GLUT5 it is present more in most important location is palm but also in other places they are present and GLUT5 is a fructose transporter once again this is an MCQ which may appear sometimes and GLUT7 is a new one it is present in endoplasmic reticulum in hepatocytes and they are actually intracellular transporter intracellular transporter and they transport glucose from endoplasmic reticulum to cytoplasm in hepatocyte. Now if we go back to our question then the question was which of the following is present in skeletal muscle and it's pretty easy now. Now from this you know the answer is GLUT4. See we are coming to it the answer is GLUT4. Now this is a technical question and it may uh, you know get you trapped. Use of dietary fiber. So mostly you we discuss about all the proteins, uh, lipids and carbohydrate metabolism but dietary fibers which is extremely important from clinical point of view because a lot of patients come to you, you know, as uh, you know with constipation or uh, flatulence, bowel disturbances and dietary fiber plays a very important clinical role in all these cases. So this question tests your knowledge regarding the dietary fiber mode of action and pathophysiology of gastric motility. So the question reads as use of dietary fibers it causes reduces uh, intestinal transit time this is point one no role in metabolism point two causes constipation point three and increases blood glucose. So let us discuss a little bit you know influence of dietary fibers. See, dietary fibers they don't normally have any nutritional value. I don't eat them for nutrition. We eat them for certain uh, axillary works basically and they uh, some of these dietary fibers are fermentable some are not fermentable anyway so particular two category particular two things that dietary fiber does one is they can call co co you know create roughage what is roughage actually dietary fiber increases the bulk of intestinal content increases the bulk of stool and by this they are doing two to three very important thing. One is they are decreasing absorption of glucose because glucose is not directly coming to the contact surface of villi. So absorption of glucose is decreased. As absorption of glucose is decreased, so therefore the blood glucose level is decreased and not increased. So therefore this option four is wrong. Now roughage or bulking bulking causes extra formation of stool so therefore dietary fibers doesn't cause constipation rather they cure constipation they are useful as a therapy in constipation now no role in metabolism once again it's a, a tricky thing dietary fiber actually from the different um, tests and um, experiments it has been seen that no dietary fiber directly is not metabolized in body but it can you know decrease um, the total amount of absorption at the same time it can increase the specific dynamic activity of digestion so it increases the metabolic rate the specific dynamic activity means the activity of metabolism which is required for metabolism or digestion itself. So if we give some dietary fiber body has to burn its calorie to cover up that dietary fiber to work up with that dietary fiber even though those dietary fiber are not adding any extra calorie to body. So therefore the calorie burning increases metabolism increases. So again this is wrong. 
So the answer which is true, the option which is left is true, that is reduces intestinal transit time. But mode of action a little bit we need to mention over here. What dietary fiber does, they does a little bit of bulking and this bulking causes stretch of mostly intestinal wall. So as stretching happens, so stretching will stimulate peristalsis. So peristalsis increases and formation of stool and passage of stool the rate of passage of stool increases which decreases the transit time transit time is the time taken by food and digestive products to pass through the gastric tract so that is decreased the second way mechanism by which dietary fiber does this dietary fiber dietary fiber some of them basically they absorb water and since they absorb water they bulk up as they bulk up again they follow this particular mechanism so which is not a component of brown sequard syndrome again brown sequard syndrome very very favorite very very favorite actually it takes your knowledge regarding the ascending and descending tracks so what is brown sequard syndrome it's a hemisection of spinal cord so that's why one side of the spinal cord on one side all the tracks will be damaged whoever is passing through now remember so if in case of a brown sequard syndrome half of spinal cord is gone so the tracks who are gone are contralateral spinothalamic so affected tracks are contralateral spinothalamic ipsilateral descending remember descending tracks are the motor tracts and ascending tracts are the sensory tracts and ipsilateral posterior column so of this spinothalamic and posterior column these two are sensory and descending is motor so lateral contralateral spinothalamic what actually they carry spinothalamic carry pain and temperature so contralateral pain and temperature will be gone because of brown sequard syndrome contralateral pain and temperature will be gone so which is not a component contralateral pain is a component contralateral temperature is a component ipsilateral posterior column and contralateral loss of proprioception now remember ipsilateral posterior column what it carries it carries vibration it carries two point discrimination it carries teognosis it carries proprioception it carries fine touch now in brown sequard syndrome ipsilateral loss of vibration will occur ipsilateral loss of two point discrimination will occur ipsilateral loss of proprioception will occur and ipsilateral loss of fine touch so ipsilateral loss of fine touch that is a component of brown sequard and ipsilateral loss of proprioception that is a component but the option says contralateral loss of proprioception so therefore this is the right answer now we are going to the next one in an experimental muscle spindle of frog if an experimental muscle spindle of frog was cut what is true now they are asking this because you see muscle fibers are known as extrafusal fibers extrafusal fibers in which muscle spindle is present which is a small you know apparatus inside muscle whose fibers run parallel to the extrafusal fiber or bigger muscle fiber and these are known as intra fusal fibers 
now muscle extra fusal fibers they are for the voluntary activity intrafusal fiber they are for the reflex activity now i have cut the spindle so i have cut the spindle so intrafusal fibers are gone so reflex will be lost but muscle actual muscle is okay so voluntary thing will be okay so only voluntary action present but stretch reflex is lost this will be the right answer now moving to the next one which antibody is seen in recent infection there are various antibodies we also have a separate immunity discussion you can also learn from there now few antibodies like iga it is basically secretory in nature it lines almost all the lumens like gi tracts like tracheobronchial tree so iga ige it is high in case of atopy in case of allergy igg it is high in case of chronic infection and igm this is high in case of acute or recent infection now we are going to the next one which of the following is cardioprotective ldl is all the cholesterol it is the concept of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol and i think it's a very straightforward one hdl high density lipoproteins these are the cardioprotective they are also known as the good cholesterol that means they are actually uh, you know protective against cardiovascular disease if hdl is high then it is said that you are protected much better protected against cardiovascular diseases whereas ldl if that is high you are more prone to develop cardiovascular disease similarly triglyceride and total cholesterol these values are also detrimental to the cardiovascular diseases if these values are high then there are also certain ratios that you can learn in medicine which will uh, tell you regarding the um, you know factors uh, negative factors for cardiovascular disease but this remain a very straightforward question hdl is a good cholesterol and that's why it is cardioprotective Oh, <laughs> oh,